today we've got Billy Moore all the way from Liverpool. It's such an honor to have you here on my show, the Dean Gunther Podcast. And I think it's going to be a great one. I'm sure a lot of the listeners will be familiar with you. You've been on many podcasts and you've got some crazy stories from, you know, from the past and the boxing and prison in Thailand and all these things. So, yeah, man, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, like you just said there, my name is Billy Moore. I'm the author of a best-selling book called The Prayer Before Dawn which is now a critically acclaimed movie. Oh, yes, yes, yes. the same name. Um, and that was all about my like, like life experience. Yeah, yeah. Like you just mentioned. It yes, was, it great was, film, by the way. It was a crazy life. Um, and I think most of the consequences were created by myself and how I behaved and how I reacted to people. No, I'm not taking responsibility. Yes, so, yes. So, yeah, that's the reality of why it was crazy. Yeah. So, um, can you tell us a bit about your childhood and your aspirations growing up? Yeah, well, when I, you know, when I was a young kid, I just wanted to, go to either box for England, join the British Army. Yeah, that was the, they were the goals. You know, yes, to yes. Do things that like, <coughs> like quite adventurous and exciting. Um, and I, I, I done totally the opposite. I went down the wrong path, ended up standing on street corners. Mixing with the wrong crowd, and as I learned years later, bad company corrupts good character because I believed I was a good kid. Yeah, you just know. the surroundings. Kind yeah, of it was it was the it was the social pressure. the social environment, um, and shit myself by the way, getting a tattoo on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now yeah. we're for speaking while getting tattooed. Now, yeah. especially we're starting on the wrist area by all the tendons. Yeah, oh, yeah. <coughs> you're messing. Anyway, right. <laughs> it'll distract me from um, talking about growing up. Yeah. Yeah, so. so how did you get into the boxing growing up? My dad used to tell us that he was a boxer, but I'd never see him fight. I'd always see him um, fighting with my mum. Oh, right. So there was a lot of violence, and I was subjected to, 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 to violence. And what do you think that does to a kid growing up, seeing, you know, a dad being violent in the family, especially towards the mother? I mean, what do you think that does to a kid? Oh, that, that has a massive impact, the, the trauma. Yeah. You know, it's you condition to believe, you know, what you see, and, you, you know, your surroundings, and how people behave. And that can have an impact on how you develop as, you know, into an Absolutely, adult. Absolutely, yeah. So for me, it was like, it was a lot of, like, there was a lot of fear. Were you scared of your dad? I was terrified. I was terrified. Um, but he also wanted to impress him and be acknowledged by him and, you know, be loved, which was very, very difficult to... To, to get from him because he was a very um, Victorian dad. Wouldn't show any any feelings. Emotions. No. Never talked about his past. Um, drank a lot of alcohol. Smoked a lot of cigarettes. So nothing with his life. Just sat about the house. So watching him was like, that's my role model, that's my hero. Are you with me? Yeah. Even though some people might think, okay, that's not the most positive role model, he was still your hero, it's still your dad. Yeah, he was my dad and I loved him. Um, even when he was beating me up, you know. But Do you think know. it made you tough as a kid being beaten up? Did you have friends at school or did you try and beat them up because of what happened mm. to you at home? No, I was getting bullied at home by my dad. And I was getting bullied at school because I was really skinny. I had knobbly knees, you know, shock of ginger hair, loads of freckles, and we never had the best clothes, so I was called names like your tramp and your scruff and um, pushed about. And because it was so kind of full of fear, I'd say, Yeah. I couldn't really, um, 
I couldn't really say to anyone. Or I was alone. Yeah. You know? Kid, kids are ruthless, you know, with yeah. the bullying. They, they don't mm. think twice. So for me, it was like on the streets getting bullied, on at home getting bullied, you know, in school getting bullied, getting name called, you know. So I never had a really like great childhood. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a positive experience. So what would you say? What was the turning point for you when you started using drugs? What led you to to do that? No, I mean it was like when I joined the boxing club. Yeah, that was like a turning point in in my confidence and my self esteem and the way. Oh yes. Yeah. So what happened was oh, it's painful. Um, <laughs> what happened for me? I joined this club to impress my dad. That was the idea. And um, I became good. Yeah. You know. I adapted to a, to, to a boxing environment pretty quick. And what did your dad skills. think? Was he impressed? Well, yeah. Well, I, I always say this. The first time, you know, I told him I was boxing, he was, yeah, okay. He was, wasn't showing any overly excited, like, uh, ways about yeah. it. Yeah. Well, come home one, one evening, I said, look, Dad, I've got a fight on Wednesday. It was only a Monday, my first fight. Um, and he didn't even look at me. He just nodded and said, OK, if you don't knock him out in the first round, I'll knock you out. Wow. And I remember that before. Jeez. Are you serious? And that scared me more than the, the, yeah. fella, the, the fella that I was going to fight. Wow. So when I went into this fight on the Wednesday, I stopped the kid in the second round. And I still felt that wasn't good enough. Really? Yeah, I went home and said to my dad, you know, he said, did you knock him out? I said, no, but I did stop him in the second round. He went, okay. And that was it. Wow. And all you want from your, your dad, especially as a young kid, is just that acknowledgement, like, well done, well done, son. Yeah. And you weren't getting that, even if, even though you were winning your fights. No, and no. So there was no, uh, there was no acceptance. Yeah. There was, um, there was no approval. There was no pass on the back. <clears throat> That's very hard on a kid, yeah. you know, emotionally, it's, it's a form of emotional abuse in a sense, you know. Yeah, and I think he didn't know any better, to be fair. Yeah. You know, like, as the years went on. And then, you know, once he started coming to my shows, it, it was too late. Yeah. You know, he was too late to be a father. I was 15 <coughs> years old by this time. You know, I think you need to, yeah. to be with, around your kids from an early age. Yeah, you know, very so important. Them. You know, allow them to make their own choices. And you've got two boys of your own now, one of four. One of four and one of one, and I couldn't even imagine. Not, well, I can't, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they are, uh, one of them's, like, he can be a really, like, he can misbehave a lot, but at the same time, he's loved. He's told he's loved. Yes, that's very important, because you know how it feels. Yeah, and he gets chastised. Yeah. You know, when he's misbehaved. Yeah, of course. But it's, um, he doesn't get locked in his bedroom. He doesn't um, get told to stand in a corner with his hand on his head. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't get like beaten for no reason at all. No. He doesn't get beaten at all. So at what point, you know, did you start uh, taking drugs for the first time? How old were you? And what do you think led you to take it? Was it pure pressure or... No, I think um, the first time I took drugs was when my auntie came down to to stay for a couple of days at my mum's. It was her sister, but her sister used to drink. She was alcoholic. She drank alcoholically. She was on all kinds of medication. Like back then, it was like she was on tamazepam and Valium. Oh yeah. And I remember she gave me one of these tamazepam tablets when I was about eleven. Wow. That was the first time, and I liked the feeling of it. Make you drowsy. Yeah, no, it was just maybe like, for like I was walking on a plank, wobbling. Yeah. Um, and then every time she came down, I used to steal them out of her handbag and just sneak them. But they, that was just like, it wasn't like, an, that didn't feel like an addiction or I was going somewhere with it. It was just a little treat now and then. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I kind of took drugs. I wouldn't say it was peer pressure. Yeah. It was more escape. Right. You know, uh, to be a part of something, to, to be accepted. And you know, who exposed you to it? Obviously, your auntie gave you that tablet, but what led you on to 
street drugs. Yeah. The illicit. How did it um, escalate? What was the first thing? Like, I saw so I was boxing and I wasn't taking drugs. I was training a lot. I was 15. I was uh, I was having fights. I was winning fights. You know, but during the, dra- the, the break, you know, the period where we didn't train, with the off-season, you know, we'd be standing on street corners with, you know, people from the area and they were smoking cigarettes and smoking weed and, you know, drinking cider and stuff and they were encouraging each other to, to participate and I was refusing and, and and a part of me didn't feel as if I was going to fit in to this kind of way of life. Yeah. So I remember one one night I, I, I took a, a go with this joint, this spliff, um, and I liked the way it made me feel. And then I became a pothead. Right. And you were still boxing at the time? No, it started like slowing down and so we... Okay. So we boxing stopped at the age of 16. Right, right. Whereas Any like, reason why you stopped? That's, that's an, I, I think I'd had about 16 fights and I'd lost a few. I'd, lo- I'd lost like the last four. Okay. So I was starting to like lose momentum yeah, and any, drive. Any, any, any like <coughs> willingness to continue. <coughs> yeah. Um, okay. And then you started smoking the weed. Yeah, and then I found like girls and, you know, cannabis, more attractive. And then I went from cannabis to, to, to LSD and then the drugology, you know, yeah, a little bit of speed. You wow. know, and then I met her. Then my mum moved from one area to another. And that kind of uh, took me addiction to another level because wow. I was right close to the city centre then. Down as, as so you were there. smack bang in the middle of it. Yeah, and I met a girl and, you know, I didn't know she smoked heroin. Oh, shit. She was, she was 19, I was 17. She was quite pretty. Wow. I found out she was on heroin a couple of days after I met her. Um, and, you know, I just joined in. And you thought, as a young boy, with all the hormones going and you fancied this bird? Yeah, I thought, you know, I you know, weighed, um, weighed up the odds and thought, OK, this can't be a bad thing. She's, she looks all right, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that was it. I was in the grip of addiction. I was using heroin and, wow. you know, then I started to withdraw from it because... I remember my first withdrawal. Yeah. Not, and I, was, I thought it was like a cold or a flu. And you didn't know what's going no, on? I was going, oh, I don't feel too good, you know. Someone said, hey, you know, you take it. And I went, what? What do you mean? He said, like, you withdraw from your heroin use. Jeez. And you, how old were you there? 17. And you were injecting heroin or just no, smoking, smoking it? it at the time. Is it just as addictive to smoke it than it is to inject? Or is it, I've heard it's worse if you inject it. Well, I was injecting it as I got a little bit older. Yeah. Um, it's, I think like you could use more a lot quicker by injecting. Wow. Because smoking takes up a bit more time. Yeah. The preparation, the... the the process of it, whereas if you inject and it's straight through, bang, and you know it's done, and then you can go and get the next hit. So for me, um, yeah, that's where my addiction took me. What would you say is one of the most <clears throat> dangerous situations you found yourself in from the, uh, you know, addiction while you were on drugs? The dangerous. I think it had overdosing. Oh really? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, could, I was surrounded by violence, and um, and you've overdosed before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was in a coma for a week. Wow! And could so you, you what, feel what it coming no, on? Did you just I, wake up? What happened right was um, I had a load of tablets on me, and I'd been pulled up by the police, and I knew we had a warrant out for me arrest. I mean, brother's a straight member, he's a straight guy, but he doesn't get in trouble, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's yeah. a year younger, but he had all his details in my head. Is that Joe? No, no, that's only. So right, right. I gave my brother's details in to the police, and he wasn't wanted by, for anything, but I'd been arrested for a breach of the peace in my brother's name. 
Right. And when I was in the back of the police van, I had loads of tablets down my socks. So I started to, I started to um, take them. Take them. as in the back of the van, and um, shit. That's all I remember. And you didn't even think of overdosing. You no. just thought I'm getting rid of evidence. Yeah, yeah. And then I woke <clears> up <throat> a week later in this hospital, handcuffed to a bed, with wow. all kinds of machines pumping round me, and my mum standing over me. And the first thing he said to me, Mum, when he opened my eyes and I was able to speak, was, you didn't tell the police who really was, did you? <laughs> and she went, oh my God, I had to. And I kicked off on it. Yeah. I went, yeah, you're out of order, why would you do that? And she went, oh my God, are you stupid? Yeah. So yeah, I went, to, I went to prison. It was probably the best thing that she ever did, to be fair. Because that was like, I've been in and out of prison at that time for a long, you know. Yeah. F- for years, growing up as a young kid, um, in and out of young offenders, couldn't stop committing crime, couldn't stop using, you know, for hella high water I tried, you know, geographicals, willpower, uh, detoxes, nothing could help, um, nothing would, was, was, was waiting yeah. for me. And is there anything that really stands out to you when you were involved in crime? In the in your younger days, in what way? Anything, maybe uh, something you got up to, or I don't know if you did you do any robberies or anything like that, you know, to pay for your habit or to selling yourself short. You know, letting people take advantage of you because you were yeah. quite weak and vulnerable. You know, where I was a solid kid when I started boxing. I started being able to defend myself. And I was going to gym and I was quite, you know, quite, quite well built. And then to lose all that, and then to humiliate yourself for drugs. Yeah. To drug dealers and, you know, um, crime was just petty stuff. It was just a fun to have it. So then, how did you end up in Thailand and what led to your arrest there? So what happened was, what, how I ended up in Thailand, I was in prison after this coma. I'd been sick to prison because he had a warrant so was, um, oh. and I was taking drugs, you know, that I'd never thought to take, you know, like tablets in prison of other people. Uh, antipsychotic tablets, they were making Jeez. me really um, they were they were they were bloating me and you yeah. know fogging my brain and slowing me down and I didn't like the way I felt and it was on the yard and it was the hottest day of the year 2003 and uh, we all decided not to go back into our cells so we were having a shit off on the on the prison yard and then someone decided you know she would climb on the prison roof and I thought that's a great idea yeah and yeah, that was a significant moment in my life because um, when one of the lads got up on the roof, you know, the whole prison erupted with che- cheers and yells of a Yeah. Go ahead. You know, and I looked <laughs> up and it looked exciting. Yeah. All the prison guards were surrounded and, you know, they closed the gates off, they were telling us to get in and everyone was refusing. And then I climbed up. And when I got on the roof, uh, when I got on the roof, you know, I got the same rapturous of applause. Yeah. People were screaming the approval and... You know, and then it stopped, and it was about the next person, and I looked down, and I thought, oh, what have I done? You know, and then I was put in segregation for seven months in a different prison. And it was at that moment where I thought, you know, I've had enough of this. Yeah. And I wrote to a um, probation officer, and he came up to see me, he said, what can I do to help you? I said, I don't know, I don't know if you're using drugs, or I don't know if you're coming to prison. What can you offer me when I get out? Because I don't feel as excited about release as I used to in the past. Because in the past, every fibre in my body was just screaming, you know, I'm going to use. And this time it was different. Yeah. I didn't want to use. I didn't want to get out. I felt safe, segregated in prison. Wow, man. And uh, he offered me a rehab. For the first time. Yeah. And I took it. Both arms. Just 
stabbed him at first. I said, okay. So, um, I mean, why did you travel to Thailand in the first place? Why did you want to go do that? Well, what happened was, once I've completed this rehab in Bristol, I relocated to, to Bristol. I met a few friends from Liverpool. Well, I yeah. met a few people who became friendly with. We were in recovery. They were clean. You know, they'd been travelling. And I'd never travelled anywhere in the UK, well, unless it was in the UK on a sweat box. Unless it was on a prison bus going to one yeah. prison. That was the only journeys I went on. So when they were talking about these, like, far off countries, you know, these ex exotic lands, let's go to Thailand, let's go to Malaysia, let's go to Bali. You know, it sounded like really, um, really exotic. Exciting. Yeah. And I got myself a passport. Made a plan to go to Thailand with this guy who'd been there before. And that was it, 2005. We headed to Bangkok for a three month backpacking holiday. That turns into a five year nightmare. <laughs> Man. So, how did, um, what led to your arrest? So, for me, you know. Three month backpacking holiday, like I said, turned into a five year nightmare. As soon as I got off the plane, I'm a world class card carrying pleasure seeker. You know, I want to feel good in any way yeah. I can. Um, I've stopped taking drugs, so I'm not like using to uh, suppress any feelings. You know, I'm like a bull in a china shop. I'm very excitable. You know, the weather's incredible. Oh, yeah. I think to myself, I've got no ties back in the UK, I've got no family. No, no kids, I'm going to learn a new language, adopt a new culture, and I'm going to live here. So I got involved in the Muay Thai boxing because I like to box. Yeah. yeah and I learned how to, to fight the way they do. Yes. In the art of um, Muay Thai. The eight limbs. The eight limbs, yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, I've done a read up about its history. Yeah, Nai, 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 Nai Pratong Lom, and you know, all the stuff that he. And how did the Thai boxing compare to normal boxing for you? Did did you enjoy it more? Yeah, that you know crossed over pretty easily because yeah. I could box, I could use my hands. Um, it was more about learning how to kick. Yes, yes, yes. And defend myself. Learning how to use the knees and how to grapple. And they are super tough, aren't they? Because oh, those yeah. kids start from like four, five, six years old. What I found is you could kick them in the head, you can kick them everywhere, and they'd stay up. Yeah. But if you throw if you threw a punch at them, they'd fall. <laughs> yeah. Quite weird. Yeah, so, it's the way they condition, they yeah, must be. You could take kicks all day, but punches they weren't the best at. So I was good at throwing punches, I wasn't great at throwing kicks. Yeah. And also for your length maybe. But also the Thai people are pretty small. Mm. I uh, bought me a, you know, one of them uh, shorts from Thailand. Yeah, tight, I think tight. it was a large and it was very, very tight. <laughs> it's very tight. Yeah, um, so I was, I was competing in all the Muay Thai fights over there, he enjoyed it. Um, got a job as a teacher, worked out there for Sylvester Stallone. Oh, wow. So I was Sylvester Stallone's stuntman on Rambo 4. How did that come about? Because, I, I mean, a, obviously you don't really look similar, you know what I mean? No, I was just stunt standing. Um, so you don't have to look, you don't have to have the same body shape. Okay, okay. Um, because it was all for the lighting. So how long did... Um, after you came to Thailand, did that opportunity come about? About five months. And that's before you got locked yeah, up? Yeah, before I got locked up. So I was working on Rambo 4. I was introduced to Sylvester Stallone. Did you did you like him as a person? Yeah, before he was an incredible uh, and oh, that's great. director as well as an actor, because um, he was yeah. director of the movie as well. Yeah, he seems like a great guy. Yeah, so, yeah, my life, you know, I'm teaching English. I've got a job teaching English in a school. Like I said, I was going to learn a new language, adopt a new culture, I was going to move out there, so I needed to provide for myself. So I got myself a job, but I'd say I'd done a TEFL online, so I had all the qualifications. And that's it, I started earning money, fighting, making, you know, being... in a, in a support role in a movie. So I had a lot of good things going on. Any aspirations to start learning the language at that time or not yet? First well, focusing on English. Put past the tie in our cap. So yeah, I learned to speak the language fluently eventually. Oh wow. 
I'm and sure still, it, you can still speak it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I speak really enough. It's amazing. Have you ever thought of going back to Thailand to visit? You won't let me back in. Oh, uh, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. If think, they would let you back in, would you want to go on a holiday? Or yeah, do you think I'd, I'd, I'd go back in a heartbeat. I love the country. Oh, country. yeah. The country in itself is amazing. It was... Like you say, the weather. If yeah. the weather, if the sun's out, all you want to do is have a good time, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> the weather was great. It was just... You know, I was young. I was naive. I was early in recovery. You know, you've got to understand, I'd lived a life that was... You know, very yeah. volatile and you know, I was in prison for most of it. I was in addiction for for years, so it was all new to me, this kind yeah. of way of living. So what then led to you being arrested in Thailand? It's like, like you know, I met a girl, I couldn't, we couldn't speak a word of English, I fell in love. You know, she broke me up because I found out she was with someone else. Uh. Uh, I was clean at the time and I, I was sitting in this bar and... I couldn't cope with how I felt and, oh, man. you know, a drink looked really attractive and I thought that was the answer to my problems. I thought that'll solve the feelings that I've got going on. And it just, it, it did briefly take all the, all the pain away, the emotional pain. Yes. The drink, but um, I've got an addictive personality, I don't break out in lumps and bumps, I break out in crime, prison and, you know, years yeah. of, like, desperation. And that's where I found myself on this path of destruction. That was horrible. And one thing led to another and you started drinking and then... Drinking, within, within, within an hour of drinking, I'm looking to buy drugs. Yeah. That's what I'm about. Um, so, yeah, I'm in, um, I'm relapsing now with the alcohol, straight into drugs. Crystal meth, China white, Yabe. What is Yabe? Yabe translated in English is crazy drug. Okay. So it's like methamphetamine and tablet form. Oh, right. And it's highly addictive. Yeah, yeah. It's like meth. Yeah, yeah. So what did you do? Were you caught using drugs or selling drugs before you got arrested? No, I thought it was like untouchable. I was using drugs, selling drugs. Um, you know, and uh, when the police came round to me, my apartment, they were, um, I had all kinds of weapons because I was paranoid, because uh -huh. of my drug use, so, you know, and I had drugs in the apartments. When they've come to the room, I've secreted the drugs where the sun doesn't shine, so I've just stuck on my ass. Um, they've come through the door, they've arrested me, the charge you would handle on a stolen mobile phone. <laughs> wow. Which I thought, okay, that's all, that's that's not too bad. And um You couldn't find the drugs. Yeah. Obviously, you know. If you're a drug addict and you've had an experience with using you know, you know not to get caught with them. And then how many times did it take for you to get caught? Were you then eventually caught with drugs before they took you to no, prison? No, 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 that's a prison with the streets away. Oh, they took you there straight away yeah, to prison yeah. so, for that? So, look, they, they've caught, they knew. They, they yeah, they knew. Me. They knew, they couldn't find out, and they knew that I was up to no good. They knew that, you know, I was, um, I was stuck and diving. So when he arrested me, he had a, I had a room full of weapons and all my knees. Um, didn't find any drugs, like I said. He had this phone which was stolen and I was, you know, charged with that. And then I went to court and he gave me three years for that. What? For a stolen phone? Yeah, three years for handling a stolen phone. So where did you get the stolen phone? Did you, uh, did they oh, track because the phone? What happened, no, what happened was, I was, because I was selling a little bit yeah. of the Right, so I was paranoid. And people were ringing me up all the time, I'd swap me phones. Okay. So these sides had come with me, come to me with phones. That, he, that, that was stolen. Oh, yes. You know, and, um, you know, 99% of the time, they're all reported, are they? So it's being reported, this one's being, um, the owner's being found to this one. I've been charged with the handling of it. And what was the thoughts that went through your head when you, when you knew, okay, I'm going to tie prison now? 
were you aware of how bad the prisons are? No, uh, I had no understanding or experience. I'd read a book once many years ago called The Damage Done by a guy called Warren Fellows and it sounded horrific. And it was about his experience in a, a prison in Bangkok. And I was reading this book whilst in a prison in the UK and I was thinking to myself, fucking hell, I'm fucking feel grateful that I'm here. Yeah. You know I mean, I wouldn't like to be where he is. And then when I'm in a prison in Thailand, I'm reading a book about a fella in the UK thinking, the lucky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the experience, the first time I went into a cell, it was, there, was, there was at least 80 people in the cell. 80? 80 people, right. There was a couple of transgenders because I noticed there was bras and underwear uh -huh. hanging up on a line in the room um, and you could smell perfume. I got ushered to the corner of the cell, you know, a little dark, dingy part of the cell by, by a toilet where there was a guy who was laying on the floor motionless and another guy, well, a transgender called Tiffany with tits and he yeah. had this boob tube, these big pair of breasts with yeah. this truck that said no money, no honey. Yeah. Oh, fucking skins are made up here. <laughs> And uh, he spoke a little bit of broken English, and I was saying, "How come this guy? Well, you know, what, 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 what's going on?" He said, "Oh, no problem. He died. He get moved in oh, on Monday. Right. I think it was Friday because it was a weekend." What? And, was uh, it not stinking? I had to sleep next to him for two days. Shit! Because it was a Thai holiday. Even that, and that's your first that time like, going in the prison, yeah, so and you're next to this dead person on a hard concrete floor, no bed. Uh, no bowl, no cup, no cutlery. You know, you have to share food off someone else's plate. You know, the first... That's horrific. The first morning we went down for breakfast, I put my spoon in this bowl and pulled out a chicken's head. Jeez, for with breakfast? A, yeah, with a moican on it and, you know, <laughs> its face. And I was like... Oh, I didn't know whether to fucking what? puke up in front of everyone. <laughs> And I looked at it and I was in, in shock horror. Bloody hell. And this Thai went, you know what? I went, do I fuck on it, mate? Yeah. And he, went, <laughs> he just grabbed it off the spoon and started sucking on it. Wow. Thought, that, that will turn your stomach inside out, especially for breakfast. Yeah, and I thought, oh my God, how am I going to survive here? You know I mean, how am, yeah. get, how am I going to get food this? Was that it? Yeah, it was like... And it stunk as well, you know, the food. Oh. There was flies hovering over it. Do you think they are used to, obviously, eating that? I mean, usually Thai people and, and Chinese, they, they, they seem to have quite a strong stomach. Yeah, they just yeah. eat anything, really. Eat anything, you know, chicken feet. That was what was yeah. coming out. Chicken feet with the toenails on and everything. It was horrible. Um, Jeez. Yeah, so that was my me, me, me initial experience of my first night and day. And how did you feel about this dead person next to you? Was he bloated or smelling? No, no he wasn't. Because um, obviously the heat and then the smell. The whole room smelled of shite. Yeah. You know, you've got to remember there's 80 people and two toilets. And two toilets? Two toilets. Can the toilet flush? No, the toilet's a hole in the ground. Oh, right. So what they had was a black bin, you know, like a dustbin. Yeah. In between these two toilets with a little tap that came on, I remember, twice a day. Once in the morning at 10am yeah. and once at night at 8pm. 8, 8 oh. And that would fill up this, this, this black bin. Yeah. And you'd use a bowl to flush the loo. So you'd be, you'd be washing in that toilet environment, uh, brushing your teeth with the same water, oh. flushing the fucking logs down. Um, you'd get opened up, say, 7 in the morning, half 7, and you'd be out on the on the yard, on the complex. And then with that heat and all that shit festering and... Is, is the toilet... Uh, do you have a little bit of privacy or no. if, you, if you take a <laughs> shit, it's open? I'm going to have a shit right, on, right in front of you right now with another 80 people staring at me. So that oh. was... Um, so when I, had to, I needed to use the toilet because, you know, the food I was eating was... Um, it was going right through me. And yeah, I, I remember. Would... That was like a novelty as well you know, because it was... a. a, a a westerner. Yeah. And I had no top on it to wear a pair of shorts. Um, you couldn't wear long legged pants or not, and it was shorts and sliders or whatever shoes. Um, 
And I went for this fucking shit in this loo with 79 faces just looking at me. And I never felt so self-obsessed in all my life. Didn't know where to put my head. I was thinking, yeah. oh, oh my God. And he had this one guy sitting there with a cigarette talking to me inside. Yeah. Oh, yo, stink, stink, stink. <laughs> stink. <laughs> what can I like? I know me, you know me shit stinks like, but you don't have to tell me about it. Yeah. You know, you don't have to like give me a running commentary on me, Lou. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was all fun and games. It was just a horrible experience, you know, it was like very dirty. Yeah. Um, the smells were horrific. I mean, you could, you know, the urine was like ammonia. Oh. Like acid. Yeah. You know, um, that was the smell. You know, but then you get used to it because yeah. it's normalised. So, what about, obviously these people, I know like South Africa prisons, you know, they they usually write a lot of the newcomers who's not a gang member or belongs to the number and all that. But like you said, it's lady boys. Surely people must have um, se do sexual favors or whatever there. So yeah, there was um, you know obviously there's relationships going on with the lady yeah. boys. But at the weekend, right? Did they have privacy or at the weekend, right? I'll tell you what happened, right? At the weekend, did have um, a wear the toilets and that um, the wash area was outside. The yeah. Place. You know, you come out your cell and there's a compound and then there's, there's toilets there because you're out the cell all day, you know, from 7 till 5 p.m. You know, it's like a city where people sell wears and tears and, you know, you can get your food and drink and ice and, you know, cigarettes and what have you, drugs. Wow. So it's like, you know, you've got to remember there's like 20,000 inmates in this prison. Sure. So this complex where I was on, there was... Um, we had a toilet where they'd make, they'd make little tents out of ta you know the blankets. Yeah. And the, the Thai lady boys would be shelling their ass in there for a pack of cigarettes. You know, but there was times when they, um, you know, there'd, there'd, there'd be a, a group of Thai men, you know, raping like a young boy that had just come into the prison. Oh my word! You know, that's in the film as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, you know, that that happened a lot. There was suicides. There was murders. Wow. So they do it especially with the young boys. So yeah. what did you have to do to uh, to not be right? Is there also a gang you need to belong to or do you just have to fight and stand up for yourself? That's, I don't know if there was a gang you needed to belong to. I think yeah. it was more like, for personally me, it was a, uh, no one came near me anyway because I was just literally down a bend, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'd be fighting with everyone. I ended up in, yeah. in all the wrong places. And I brought all my problems to myself and you could see that you know, I wasn't um, going to tolerate any No, shit. that's it. They prey on the on the weak. Yeah, and the they, yeah, and they're scared. The scared, the vulnerable. Obviously, anybody will be scared to go in, but like you say, you're willing to fight and probably die in there yeah. to not be made a bitch or whatever. That wasn't going to be no one's bitch. No. So how did the um, the prison life, you know, compare to what you had in mind? It's going to be like. I had no way. Um, idea what it'd be like in the first place to be fair yeah but when i did go in it was like i was quite shocked you were left to your own devices it was run by inmates so you had you know a group of inmates that were trusted by the prison officers yeah to oversee okay the prison they were given like a whistle and buttons and shorts and shirts so they stood out differently yeah so they were like uh, very privileged inmates wow they, which they received, they, you know, a lot of benefits. Yes, yes. Did some so, of them have firearms? No, no, no. Yeah. They never had firearms, but they had keys. Really? Keys? Yeah, just to the cells. So they can come and go as they please? Yeah, yeah. So they let you in and out. Uh, but not to, like, not to the gates that led out to the prison. You know, yeah, right? yeah. And was prison guards ever taken hostage or anything? No, no. We had two prison officers overseeing a thousand inmates on one unit. That is incredible. They that were armed. It's impossible really, isn't it? They were armed. They were um, you know, they had access to shotguns and automatic weapons. I mean two people to a thousand, that is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean if but the, they but the respect yeah. they had from the Thai inmates was incredible. Yeah. They were very subservient. Yes. They, they knew not to mess about. Yeah. Um, 
with any of these prison guards because they would take their life. Yeah, they, they would think nothing no, of just shooting think, you like they a dog. They would, yeah, they, they just pin you to the wall and end your life. And they knew, yeah. it, and that's the respect um, that they had. So it was very, um, yes, say, no, say, very, very full of humility and humbleness. Yeah, yeah. So what would you say was the most challenging aspects in life on a daily, you know, daily aspect of life in the prison? I think it was getting through the day, just getting through the day alive yeah. because I was addicted to, you know, uh, changing the way I felt and using drugs to suppress, you know, the reality of life in, in, inside that, that prison. And I began to, to, to use drugs which I couldn't afford, couldn't, couldn't really pay for them. Yeah. I was getting them. You know, I was, I was in debt, you know, and I'd witnessed a guy, a young guy, 25 years old, a Thai guy, um, he was getting chased, he had a pair of flip-flops on, or sliders, and he was running, and he, he was heading past me, and I could hear this, ch -ch -ch -ch, with his shoes, but he was screaming at the same time, and he was being chased by a man, uh, another Thai guy, with a knife, not, oh. a, not a blade, with a knife. Um, the guy standing next to me, he's come running out with a chair and smacked this other guy in the face with it. He's hit the floor, the guy with the knife is now on top of this man and he's stabbing away. And I'm watching it, um, and he must have stabbed him at least 50 times. And it wasn't what? in a frenzy, it was like, there were death shots, you know, in the neck, in the back. Yeah. In his abdomen, in his legs, everywhere. And when did he stop stabbing him? Did he just continue stabbing? Yeah, everyone was screaming. There was a crowd then screaming. Calm man. And, and he understood a bit of Thai then. And I knew that they were saying, kill it, kill it. What? He must have done something uh, yeah. to deserve this. So w why would they do that? Does he owe money or is it something he did outside? No, it, was, it was gang related. Okay. Um, it was something to do with phones. So what drugs. will happen to the guy who killed him in prison? Will they kill him or...? Do no, he ended up with a four-year sentence. The, you know, the maximum sentence you could receive for killing another person within the prison was four years. Four years? And you do the full four years? I don't know, but fucking hell. You so... Do, you do four years out here for fucking nothing, can't you? So how long sentence did you get then? Was it four? Three years. Three years? Yeah. And at that time, was anybody coming to visit you, or lawyers, or...? No, no, I, was, I, did, I, did, um, I had a few, I had a brief in the early days. She was tight, she just wanted money, I never had it. So I had to just go with what they gave me in the yeah. courts. Um, the embassy, they came up. And then the missionaries, they were really, like, really generous and giving. And they'd get us food twice a week. You know, from the canteen, supplies with cigarettes. Yeah. So that kind of health. So when you get cigarettes, you can buy drugs. And, right. You know, the cigarettes I was getting, I was I was swapping for drugs. Tramadol tablets, painkillers, because they were like opiate based. Yeah. And I liked the way they made me feel. Um, then there was another drug called Yellow Motorbike, which was like an ephedrine cough tablet, which created you, created hallucinations within you. Right. So that was another way of changing the way you felt. It was taking volume or any yes, Atavan. Yes. That's where I first oh, come. Yes. I come across Atavan in there. Um, that's insane. So that's... Lorazepam, stuff yeah. like that. All tablets that were like just changing the way you felt. Yeah. And, and damage. Um, but then I was in debt. Then I was getting threatened with HIV infected syringes. Oh man. Yeah, that were barrels improvised into to needles. So that's actually something they, they did. They'll yeah, infect yeah. you with HIV. Yeah. yeah, so that was that was a frightening aim. Oh yeah. That was, I mean like you know you're gonna die, but not quickly. Yes, yes, yes. So to be subjected to, to that threat was was frightening. Did you ever worry eating the food that even that might be infected with stuff? No, no, it's, I got past that, I was just surviving. Um, Did you eventually adapt to eating the food? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. What else did they give you? Um, it was, I ended up like mainly eating sticky rice um, with 
You know, a little. Yeah. Sometimes you'd get chicken or beef. This was like trying to eat a shoe. <laughs> Tough as you like. <laughs> um, but mainly, you know, chicken and rice. Yeah. Yeah. And were there any uh, particular strategies or routines that you did to help maintain your sanity? Yeah, I got involved in a Muay Thai boxing in there. Oh, yes. Especially because I was always fighting within the, with other inmates. And I remember this prison guard, uh, Prasit, he was quite nice, you know, uh, to me. And he said to me, you need to join the boxing team because you're going to end up dead fighting. So, uh, yeah, join the boxing team. That promoted a bit of discipline and routine in me. Yeah. You could see it box, and during the time of the year, he set on a show and he got me involved in this fight with this guy called Pon, who was probably the best that they had at my weight. Yeah. And I beat him, and the acceptance I got oh, from that wow. was... Um, How did you beat him? Did you knock him down? Yeah, just banged him out. And did you guys get any money, or did you no, get better no. food or anything got like that? Got better food, got put in a better cell. That's yeah. worth fighting for, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so I got to put in a call Hong Nakila, which was like the sports room. And that was with a. Is this like the worst bit of you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, the wrist. Yeah. The wrist area is a bit nippy. Still got to do around the back, but it's, it's a bit harder to reach there. So yeah. I'll come there eventually. So can you uh, describe a memorable boxing match that you had in prison? Yeah, the first one. Because it. I hadn't really trained for it, to be honest. Yeah. I just agreed to fight this guy, thinking I was fit enough when I wasn't. <laughs> 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 uh, and, I, I, and I just kind of relied on the skills that he had, and I was in the hope that I'd, I'd, I'd win before I, I was exhausted, which, you know, lucky enough I did. I was blessed with the opportunity to hit him uh, and put him down, and, and that kind of, um, that, that gave me a lot of respect. Yes, yes. I bet it was a massive uh, confidence booster. It said, yeah, it, it helped, you know, when I said it, it helped me get a move to a better cell, you know, with, with less inmates in it and better food. Uh, and then that soon changed when they moved me to, bon to, uh, to Bangkok. Right. So they took away all the boxing, all the friends that had... Um, oh, and they moved you to a different prison. And then prison. moved me from Chiang Mai Central Prison, because that's all happened in Chiang Mai Central Prison. Yeah. To Bangkok, which was like a bigger prison and a bigger complex, and a lot more foreigners were in there. And you know, right. we had a year left, and you know, I was in debt again. I'd, I'd lost kind of, kind of cleared my mind a little bit in Chiang Mai with the boxing that gave me that discipline again, that routine. So, once we took that away from me, I was left with nothing. Um, Why did they move you to a different prison? It's what they do. The um, once a year, the Right. The transfer. So you don't familiarise too much? Yeah, so they moved, like, there was me and a, another number of foreigners that went. I didn't want to go, to be fair. I was, yeah. I was quite settled where I was. But once the, they moved me, it was, um, I was like, uh, and I remember that the boxing coach saying to me before I left, he went, Billy, do not cause any trouble in this prison in Bangkok. Yeah. It's not like Chiang Mai. How is it worse? It was, yeah, oh yeah, it was much worse, you know, again, rapes, murders, insanity. I watched the guy come out, because everything was a queue, you had to queue for everything. Queue yeah. for your food, all the Africans, look at there was loads of Africans in there. Really? You know? Yeah. From, like, uh, from, black Africans yeah, black or South Africans? Africans? Well, black Africans from Tanzania, yeah. uh, from Ghana. Uh, I was in a shell with ten inmates. You know, one was called Willie, he was from uh, from Ghana. Then, yeah. you had, then you had Suleiman Kurosia, he was doing life. Then you had Bonzo, he was doing life. So what are they in there for? Mostly drugs? Drugs. Yeah. Drugs. They were getting, they were being lifed off of drugs. Um, so I was in this cell with, with, with three three Africans. This, 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 this cell I was in was called the crazy room, right? No one wants to go in that cell. Right. Why is that? I was in, I was in a bigger shell at the time with forty inmates all tight. Yeah. And I was saying to the tight the tight screws, you know, the, the prison officers look at me out of this cell with these ties. I said I fucking can't speak a word of fucking tight. They don't speak English, I'm struggling. I said, hey, can you put me in a room where there's foreigners? And it was this room which was called the crazy room. I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. 
He said, there's a space in cell 86. I said, okay, put me in there. And as I was telling people I was going in this cell, they were going, man, you're fucking crazy, don't go in there, you know. It's a fucking, it's a, the crazy dude. I went in there and it was like a Wild West fucking frontier fucking show. There was really? kids kicking off in there, telly getting smashed up. There was arguments. There was different religions. I used to, I, I just lay there and just laughed. I just found it quite amusing. Right? <laughs> really? You had a Muslim, <laughs> you had a Christian, yeah. you had an atheist, <clears throat> you had these couple of pedophiles that were in there. One from Australia, one from Canada. One was called Jason Minzer, right? Yeah. He was in there for raping a two year old baby, <clears throat> right? That's he was crazy. In, he, was, he was in our cell, right? And there was another guy called Mr. Swirly, right? You can Google these bastards. The f he was from Canada. Horrible fuckers, right? They were both, like, in the cell, sleeping next to each other, you know, colluding with each other. No one had have nothing to do with them. And I'll tell you something now, this is what it was about, right? If you could not lay a finger on them, right? Because if really? you did, you'd end up in something called the Hong Soi, which was uh, the most dangerous part of the prison with the most vicious inmates you could come across. Really? You know, so if you attack them, that's where you go. Like, it was like a segregation in a Thai prison, oh, right? Wow. But it was like you'd fucking end up getting raped and fucking, you know, lucky to fucking survive in there. So that was the fear you had, right? And they knew that. So I'm in this cell and it was fucking crazy. Um, you had this Indian guy in there called Sunil and um, he was fucking round the bend. Always wanking. Really? Yeah, he was just like... In just the open? Just fucking wanking away, right? <laughs> and then you go in the toilet, like, there's like, it was like, you had the little curtain around this little uh, toilet, like a little, at the end of the cell. But he, he just knew what he was doing, and then he'd come out and he'd go, I like the jiggy jiggy. And, and he was saying, he wanted to take me down to the pig farm on Valentine's Day. What? He reckons the screws would let us go down and we could pick the best pig. I was like, I laughed me out. I was like, that's your fucking man. <laughs> he was in for murder. Oh my word. So, he yeah. sounds like he's got a few screws oh, loose, mate, man. He was fucking metal. The whole cell was fucking crazy. I felt like I was sane. I'm thinking, <laughs> wow, I was in you there. You probably were. I was in there. I was in that cell for three months thinking, what the fuck am I Did you never with? feel uh, threatened for your no, life? No, no. That, they knew what I was about. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd kind of adapted to prison environment by the time. Yes. I was conditioned. I got to a point, this is how conditioned I was, and I told this story to someone when I got back to, to Wandsworth on a repatriation, right? So, you used to have to, like I said, and when we got to Bangkok, because it was a bigger prison, there was more inmates, we had to wait in queues for everything. So, in the morning, we'd get up, and we'd wait in this long queue for a bit of hot water. Yeah. Right? Out of this uh, machine. And the queue would be, like, half an hour by the time you got there, you know? Yeah. And you want to get up, you want to bit of hot water for a cup of coffee. And I remember one morning waiting in this queue and this guy comes running out of the commando's office where the, 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 the prison officers were. Yeah? Um, with blood squirting out. Oh my of, word. The, of these holes that he'd punched himself with. He had this um, ice pick and he took himself yeah. hostage. But he was known to have a HIV and the blood was just gushing and squirting out of him. Oh, and everyone shit. was panicking. When he come running out, the, the screws, the inmates, the, yeah. they're all like, whoa. And everyone in the queue, waiting for the hot water, all like dispersed and like, yeah. was watching it. And the first thing that came to my mind was, he's right, I can get some hot water now. <laughs> yeah. Right, it didn't even fucking phase me. Really? I just thought, right, he's distracting everyone. Good stuff, I'm gonna get some hot water now. <laughs> And I said that to him, what? Your yeah, blood bursting out of every orifice. You know, wow. he, was, um, he was taking himself hostage and you just thought... Now's my chance to get yeah, in the line. Yeah, chance to get the water. It's crazy, isn't it? Wow, yeah. It just shows you how deprived you guys are from, yeah, you yeah. know, from yeah. basic necessities. There was, a, there was a Russian guy in there called Roman. Um, he was in for robbery on ladyboys, what he'd do, 
He said, go back to the room with them. Knock them out. <laughs> and then rob them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was what his yeah. MO was. Right. I think he'd sleep with them first. And then knock them out and then rob wow. them. Wow. But he'd been put in prison. I think he got a five for that. Jeez. But um, as far as I know, some of those lady boys, they... You know, they will uh, they will beat men up. Oh, the vicious. These tourists who get clever with them, yeah. they'll, they'll just beat them up because they're drunk half the time as well. Yeah, they, um, I've had a few arguments and a few confrontations and I thought the biggest, you know, the, you know, the biggest fear was getting beat up by a fellow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And having to fucking sell everyone. Yeah, so you don't want that I, in I, prison. I, I, I thought, I'm not getting in the fucking ring with this cunt. Yeah. They had the screws in uh, this prison, though. They were very uh, vicious, you know, like, because the, the weather's like, it's in its, it's in its 40s there. You know, late 30s to yeah. 40s degrees. It's fucking quite hot. And um, I remember, this is what they used to do. They used to, like, you know, like, someone would be fucking accused of stealing or. Yeah. They'd, they'd be fighting. You know, the punishment was um, quite severe. What they'd do. I remember these two lady boys were fighting with each other. So they do like a circle on this exercise yard. Yeah. Put gloves on these two lady boys. And had them standing opposite each other in the in 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 the heat. You know, this this yeah. This, and then this heat, just throwing punches at each other, but not actually making contact. Okay. So they were in a circle, but they couldn't actually hit each other. But that was the that was the punishment all day long. And then another one had stole something, right? I remember this one. He'd stole a fucking bottle of shampoo. This fella, this Thai fella. And he had him standing on a crate. Yeah. In a pair of shorts with all his, like, with his top off, with a sign round him. It was in, written inside, but it said, Thief. Wow. And he kept him in there, like, on this, this crate for hours. Yeah. With this heat beating down on him. Just dead in, you know, just really in your main stuff. Yeah. And I wrote about all this. I was like, well, can I not document this? You know what I mean? You couldn't invent this stuff. Yeah. And did you ever witness, uh, like, any other brutal murders in there? No. I'd walk past cells and there'd be people, like, hanging from the bars. Wow. I've come across that a few times. Every time you'd go for your medication in the, uh, the hospital, yeah, you'd have to ste step over bodies that were wrapped up in white sheets. You know, I've... That was quite regular. Yeah. Have you ever met any other South Africans in there? No. Oh, eh, no, 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 no. So what specific moment made you then turn your life around, you know, to stop using drugs? Did you stop taking the drugs while you were in prison eventually? No, it was kind of, I was, the battle was, you know, I'd stopped taking drugs years before I'd went to Thailand that night. That was, yeah. uh, you know, I had some, um, I had an understanding of an addiction. So I knew there was a better way to live because I experienced it. So for me, it was that fight within me, you know. Um, so when I come back from, from Thailand, when I was released, and I was taken to Wandsworth Prison. You know, um, that's when my life started to kind of, I needed to grow up. Yeah. Stop doing what I was doing. And were you still taking things in prison, like? Yeah. Yeah, but... Uh, Did you find it challenging to try and stop? Yeah, because you should have it by, you know... I think there's more drugs in prison than there is on the streets. Yeah, wow. And like you say, if you get in debt over there, it's like... A death sentence, isn't it? Yeah. So, what was then one of your biggest challenges that you face upon your release and uh, return back to the UK? Adapting to uh, the way of living in the UK. Yeah. After being in Thailand for five years, comparing you know, the food and you know the way of life. Yeah. And the prices of things. So I was looking at all the differences. Was there a certain meal that you were looking forward to to have once you got back? Just the mahis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was the You're looking forward to that, eh? Yeah. Just, just the McDonald's. 
I guess it must have been like being born again. It was, yeah. It was was uh, it sad to leave or were you overwhelmed no, with happiness? It was, it was sad because it, I'd made a lot of friends as well, you know. Uh, yeah. I'd learned to speak Thai. You know, the last 12 months of my sentence in Thailand, I was quite calm and, you know, I wasn't using drugs. Um, I hadn't used the drug for almost 12 months whilst, they, whilst I was away. I'd stopped smoking as well. Um, wow. I guess it, it gets repatriated back to the UK, you know. And again, you know, I didn't smoke and I didn't take any drugs whilst I was in there. But I was given medication for an injury that had happened to me whilst I was over in Southeast Asia. I came off a motorbike whilst I was in Laos. Yeah. And the bike I was on, it flew in the air, landed on my chest, broke my ribs, crushed my lung, and the handlebar went right through my stomach. Oh. So I was rushed to this hospital uh, in a wheelbarrow with blood gushing, swishing in the bottom of this wheel. Because there was no ambulance service to speak of. And this Irish guy had seen me on the road, dying, and he um, saved my life. And uh, I'd been given two operations in a prison in Thailand. So when I got back to the UK, I had, um, I had to go to a hospital in, in the UK and I was given medication. And like I said, medication doesn't go down too well with me. I was given opiate-based medication and I started to like it again. Oh. So upon release, you know, I tried my best to keep my head. That's when I went back to Bournemouth. Oh, yes. So I went to Boscombe. Um, what year was that? That was in 2010. Okay. And I stayed with a friend of mine, a good friend, Jason Raven. But Jason had ended up using, but he was managed over his addiction. And he was always saying, look, don't get back into this bill. He would never like encourage me to use one of them. Yes, yes. Um, he'd always keep it away from me. But like I remember when he went to sleep one night, I, I sneaked into his room and, and stole his drugs. And used a little oh. bit. And that for me was just again I was using and you know, I was back into in the grip of addiction. Did you use heroin again? Yeah, heroin, crack everything. cocaine, everything. And how long were you on that before you went sober again? So I went, uh, I got rushed to hospital because my leg, I had an infection in my leg. I was in Bournemouth, I hadn't even been home from, since I'd been released from Thailand. I didn't see my mum for five, six years. And I, um, the doctors phoned my mum up in Liverpool and said, look, your son's not too good here. Uh, He's got no way to live and he's been using heavily for uh, the past eight months. And she just said, Well, put him in a taxi and send him back here. So I went, oh. to, I went to Liverpool. Um, I moved in with my mum and her partner and my brother Joe. Yeah. Put myself in a detox. I got myself That's back into recovery again. So I ended up like, um, yeah, well I was five years clean at one point. I had a house, a job, a girlfriend. Um, I'd rebuilt my life, I was writing this book. Well, I'd written it, actually, I prayed before dawn. Yes. You know, I was in the process of um, making a movie about it. So life was actually, you know, it was great. Yeah. You know, it was like, something like positive and coming out of, out of all this negative stuff and then one morning no sorry one evening it was you know this girl I, I was with they kind of broke apart the relationship so I was left to be on devices you know what I mean yeah and I started playing a field and going out on dates and I was going out with this girl who was from the Philippines I was meeting her for the first time and as I was shaving, I seen this lump in my neck. Yeah. And I didn't know what it was. So I said to her, look, I felt really self-conscious about it. And I said, look, I need to go to a walk in. She said, I'll come with you. This was the first date. Yeah. She came to walk in health centre with me. This lump was quite grotesque. Come out of nowhere. Didn't know what it was. 
Um, she stayed with me for a few hours. The walking centre doctor didn't know what it was. She said, look, you best go and see your own doctor. I went to see my own doctor the next day. She didn't have any idea what, was, what it was. She sent me to a specialist. They kind of didn't know what it was, but assumed it might have been what? a blood clot that had, like, had caused due to like, lifting heavy weights during the deadlift. Yeah. And I'd strained my me, me neck muscle and it was clotted. Um, I said, okay. So I was going to Thailand, but I'd booked myself for Thailand for three months. After that, because I thought I could go back, because they were filming over there. Yeah, so you were allowed to go then? No, no, I didn't know. I'll tell you what happened. I, you know, I, thought I just bought the ticket in, in the open go. This is when I found out I couldn't go. Right. Yeah, we had this lump in my neck still. I thought it was a blood clot. He said it'd wear its way out, give it a couple of months, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's okay, it looks horrible, but I'll, I'll suffer it. Gets to Manchester Airport, all ready to go to Bangkok and be on set with a prayer before dawn, the movie. And as I'm putting my ticket in, he went, have you ever been in trouble in Thailand? I went, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he went, have you ever had an overstay? I thought, there's something going on here, you know what I mean? I went, well, yeah. He said, how long for? I said, five years. He said, well, unfortunately, you can't go back. You've got a mark on your passport. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I said, fucking hell. Gutted. So, you know, feeling a bit like this island. I got a taxi back to my home address in Liverpool. And when he opened the door, there was a letter on the floor from an oncologist. Yeah. Department in the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Wanted to see me immediately. So I went in to see them a couple of days after I got home. They took a biopsy and said, look, you know, the sad news is you've got cancer. Shit. Stage three, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, you're going to need to go on chemotherapy. Yeah. I was like, what the fuck? You know, I was in shock, you know, like five years clean. Yeah. Being diagnosed with stage three cancer. Is stage three still reversible? Or it was aggression. Or was it, you stage know? four, I think it's... You can't do anything about it, right? Yeah, you can still do something with stage four. Stage Is three it? was like, it, you know, it was it's a fatal kind of illness. So it yeah, was like, it was it saved your life by not going to Thailand. Yeah, then. that's exactly. So he, he said, look, you know, there's a chance you could lose your life here, and you know, at the same time, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was on this chemotherapy, it was like 15 and a half stone. I went from 15 and a half stone to nine stone. I lost all my hair. Wow. So you've done the chemo. How many treatments did you have to get? Six. Six? Yeah, and then um, within that time I was on chemo, we ended up uh, relapsing. Oh, I was given a big. I was given a big payout from the film. Um, so that... So you relapse, you take drugs while you're on chemo? Yeah, I was smoking crack, heroin, Shit. smoking weed, I was growing weed, I was cultivating it, um, I was taking tablets, cocaine, uh, CBD oil, and at the same time wow. trying, to take, <laughs> trying to eat healthy. <laughs> Honestly, God, I was fucking mad. I was eating all kinds of great foods, superfoods. Right, because someone said, get the superfoods in you. <laughs> you know, keep away, you know, keep <laughs> acidic stuff and all that. Keep away from sugar. And yeah. Yeah, I'll do all that. And which it was, because you had the money at the time. And I was, then I was smoking crack and heroin. <laughs> taking fucking smoking weed. Wow. It was fucking absolutely crazy. Um, yeah, no, bonkers. And that was a brief period that engulfed me for about eight months of my life. I lost my job, I lost my house, the girlfriend I was with left me. Um, all my furniture got, like, repossessed and taken because I couldn't afford it uh, and I was left sat on a fucking milk crate in the oh. front room with nothing nine stone ballsy as fuck with fuck all shit looking in a shit state from the chemo yeah, and the drugs yeah terrible I can show you the picture Dean yeah I'll send you some, um, yeah yeah for sure and I'll, I'll put it on you know so people can just yeah. see yeah. So yeah, I'm in a, in a in a fucking terrible state, and then he ended up look. Uh, there's there's no there, you know there's no um. I ended up fucking. I had a neighbour who I didn't really get on with. Yeah. 
you'd always be fucking knocking at my door, moaning about my car or something, you know what I mean? And when he went on holiday, he broke into his house. I yeah. Be, I just couldn't be asked to get after him. He just fucking... Didn't break in and as such, the neighbour, someone said the, the alarm went off and the neighbour had the keys. And he opened the front door and I was like, go in and have a look. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I was on camera and I ended up getting arrested. But before I got arrested, the day, you know, the minute I come out of that fucking neighbour's house, I went back to mine. I knew it fucking, I knew, I knew I didn't look bottom. Because something said to me, look, this is the lowest of the low. Yeah. He just hit a rock there. Yeah. And it was the first time that he admitted he had a problem. And I phoned up the producers and said, look, I need help. Yeah. And he came in a form of like, a you know, private like rehab in Essex that cost a fortune called Sanctuary Lodge. Yeah. And uh, that was in September 2017. And I haven't used a drink or a drug since. That's amazing, man. Well done. However, when I came out of the rehab, I got arrested, charged, and sent to prison. For what? For breaking into the neighbours. Oh. So while I was in prison, my film was getting released in the cinema. And it feels like your life's almost falling apart. Meanwhile, you've got a film coming out. Yeah. And, I mean, when you were in prison, your mom never could come visit you or... Oh, yeah, my mother came. Well, your in dad. Thailand. Or in, 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 in the UK. Yeah. In the UK. In Thailand, did you never get... No, no, no family. Was it not allowed? Yeah, it would have been, but they couldn't afford it. They can't afford coming oh. up and down, especially if you're there for five years. Yeah. No, they couldn't cut. And I mean, your dad also had uh, cancer. Yeah, he passed away in 2013. But I had the opportunity to, 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 to have a role in the film. And yeah. the director said to me, did your dad ever come and see you in prison? I went, no. He said, well, he will do in this one. I said, why? He said, because I'd like you to play your father. Wow. I was like, wow. That's amazing. I bet that meant a lot to you, eh? It's it because he said to me, put yourself in your dad's shoes. What would you say if you were your dad yeah. to your son? I said, if I was my dad and my son was coming to me, what I'd want to hear from my dad is, is I love you. Yes. And I mean it, you know what I mean? So I couldn't even string that sentence together. Yeah. You know, when, when it came to filming, I couldn't even, because the emotions were, were all over me and um, wow. he said, look, we're not even going to say not. He said that. Yeah. It means more. Yes. Sometimes saying nothing also says a lot. Yeah. I mean, that film, that film is so, it looks very accurate. It feels like they are there in the prison when you look at it. It was yeah. amazing. I mean, I watched it twice, me and my missus as well. I've had it on here before. And um, long before I even spoke to you, you know, just because... Yeah. Um, it's, it's such a amazing film about, about your life. Also the fact that it's a true story and as a scouser to be in Thailand, you're completely, you know, yeah. out of your environment, your home, away from your people and then to survive in there. It's, uh, yeah, a prayer before dawn. Obviously you've got the book out. Would you say the book says a bit more than the film? Because obviously films are only so long. Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, the book, it's adapted from the book. Um, the book goes into a little bit of a background and the contributing factors that led to why yeah. you know, I became an addict. And um, you know, the behaviour and the fear and the anxiety and you know, the growing up and the adverse childhood experiences, the trauma. So that kind of um, painted a picture, whereas the film just went straight into the prison environment. Yes, yes, yes. Kind of built the story around that. Yeah. I mean, usually books will, will tell you a lot more. And I think the great thing about a book is you can, you can uh, almost envision your own story in front of you. You know, yeah. that's a beautiful thing about it. Even if you read Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, you see the story in front of you, in your imagination. I used to love reading when I was young and I, I should get on it more. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very cathartic as well, writing. It's very healing. Yeah, I mean, how did that feel to you, writing? I felt you like know. I was writing about someone else's life story. Yeah. Yeah, it was quite, when I watched the movie, it was like, like from a third person's point of view, you know what I mean? Did it feel like a lot of weight come off your shoulder yeah, to you yeah, clear yeah, it all yeah, out? Yeah, because it's trying to share, like, my experiences with other inmates yeah. and ones with and they couldn't identify and they were looking at me like there was something wrong. I thought, yes. I have to put this, I've so started to put it down on paper and read it back to myself and I was like, wow, did this really happen? So what inspired you then to write uh, a prayer before dawn and, and how has that, you know, um, affected your life to, to write about your, everything you've been through? And I remember like, I'll tell you what inspired me to write a book was, you know, once, when I was in prison years ago in a prison called Stafford, I was 25 years old and I was sharing the cell with this, this Irish guy called Terry Jenkins and I remember being on the bottom bunk and shouting up to him, you know what lad, I'm going to write a book about my life, you know. <laughs> and he popped his head over and went, who's going to read a book about you, you fucking idiot? <laughs> All you've done is fucking smoke drugs and go to prison. What are you going to write about? And it just stopped me in my tracks and I thought, he's fucking right, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then years later, he had all these experiences, you know, in, in Thailand and, you know, uh, working with Sylvester Stallone and ending up in a prison in Bangkok and, you know, being subjected to a lot of horrific uh, scenes. I thought you couldn't fucking invent it. So I began to write about the experience and after like two years it came to fruition and not only did it help me like mentally it kind of gave me like an opportunity to to be honest about how I felt yeah and I found that was more attractive when people read it instead of making stories up and lies yeah I'm talking about how hard I was and how brave I was and when in reality I was just a frightened boy. Yeah. That was found that found myself in these fucking horrible situations because of my circumstances. And how did you decide on the name? What because, inspired that? Because when I was in uh, Bangkok we'd get wake up we'd you know we'd, we'd wake us up every morning to the sound of prayers. So at first you'd, you'd wake up to like the Islamic call, the Islamic call to, to pray, the Fajr. Oh yeah. And then it'd be the Buddhist, they'd be saying the prayers. It'd all be hypnotic. Yeah. And but I'd, you... I'd do a prayer and you'd see the sun rising through the little window at the top of the cell. Yeah. And I don't know, it just came to me a prayer before dawn. That's really good, really fitting. Yeah. I mean, you converted to Islam as well, didn't you? Yeah, they changed my name to Yusuf Muhammad and uh, for a short period of time because yeah. it was um, it was a way to survive. It was yeah, yeah. I seen these Muslims eating this food, and I just paid a bill and this debt that he owed, and he had no money. I stopped taking drugs. I was hungry, and these uh, these Muslim guys were eating this little this this food like a picnic. It was. He said to me, why don't you come and join us? So I did, and I said, I'll come back tomorrow. He said, really, only, you know, our Muslim brothers eat here. So that was it. The next day, I came back, put a sarong on, a skull cap, and changed my name to Yusuf Muhammad. <laughs> yeah. I was going to call myself Muhammad Ali, because that was the only time, that was the only Muslim name I knew. <laughs> <laughs> then I knew there was a kid from my house called Yusuf, and I thought, that's Muslim, isn't it? Yeah. Did you have to choose your own name? Yeah, I just chose it anyway. My name's Yusuf Mahamdou. So, Billy, what is your future plans and aspirations going forward now? To share my experience with, like, you know, the youth in our communities and allow them to understand that there's a different path in life. And the one that I took doesn't have to be the one that they take because there's no life, you know, inside a prison or... Yeah in addiction, struggling, suffering, you know, not knowing what's wrong yeah. with you, when in reality, most of the problems are created by 
you know, substance misuse, yeah. alcohol yeah. misuse. Um, there's a lot of trauma growing up. And, you know, my advice to people is just to talk about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Share their experiences. Yeah. Don't be, don't be afraid of what yes. you know what I mean? And for kids who's curious to try uh, drugs, things like that, peer pressure, what would you tell them? Yeah, just, just be mindful about what you're taking. And if you're going to, you know, because I'm not here to tell anyone not to, well, can't. Yeah, yeah. Um, just like, just, if you're going to take drugs, make sure you take them in a safe environment with people around you. Yes. So, you've also got a YouTube channel. I know you go around, you've been yesterday to, what was the place name? Most Moston. Moston. So, you go to dangerous areas in the UK, poverty. Poverty stricken, deprived yeah. areas and... I shine a light upon like, you know, the communities yes. within our city because, you know, people at home don't see this. You know, yeah, yeah. The, the, the struggles, you know, the poverty, the homelessness, and the pain with this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what is your YouTube called so people can find you on your Instagram? We'll put it in the description yeah. anyway. It's called the All or Nothing Podcast with myself, Billy Moore. The All or Nothing Podcast. The All or Nothing. Yeah. Nice. So do you have any any last things you want to say to the listeners out there? I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who watches and supports Dean's channel. I've had a great chat with him. Uh, I've learned a lot from this guy, by the way. He's very he's full of wisdom, pearls of it. And he's given me some, some, some understanding of, you know, how I, you know, need to kind of move forward in my own life as well. So I'm always learning. So any last words from me, it'll be just like, you know, stay strong, keep your head above water. If you've got any problems and you, you're struggling, just remember you're not alone. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, thanks for listening. Great stuff, brother. Thank you everybody for listening. Remember if you enjoyed the podcast, remember to subscribe, hit the notification bell so when you so you are be updated when I upload a new video. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Billy. It was a pleasure, my man. It's a pleasure, mate. It was painful. It was a painful pleasure. It's painful, <laughs> but it's for life. It's for life. <laughs>